What is a serial killer? A serial killer is typically defined as a person who commits a series of murders, usually with significant intervals of time between them. These killings are often carried out in a similar fashion and are driven by a psychological urge or compulsion. Key characteristics of serial killers include number one, multiple murders, number two, psychological gratification, number three, patterns or characteristics, number four, periods of dormancy, number five, compulsion, number six, lack of personal connection, and number seven, deceptive and manipulative. One of the earliest people ever recorded that fit this bill nearly perfectly is the Han Dynasty Ripper, Liu Pengli. At the age of 29, will terrorize his inherited kingdom's citizens over the course of 30 years, murdering, plundering for the sport of it. Eventually, a citizen will alert the emperor and the court would request his execution. Supposedly, however, Liu would be banished to Shenyang and stripped of his sovereignty instead. Today we explore this tale and provide much more context to it going over what we can glean from the few accounts of this era in China about the Han Dynasty and the possible political intrigue that would lead to this serial killer being banished and not executed for his heinous crimes. We will ask the questions. How did this all come to be? Who was Liu Pengli? Why was he banished if he was a prince? How many people did he actually kill? And how much of this is true? All, all this and much more will be answered on today's historical quarrel. Welcome back to Historical Quarrels, everyone. I am your host, Tyler Eckhart, or better known as Tyler Three Knuckle Eckhart. Uh, for those of you that are just tuning in and are confused by that nickname, I am fond of the Three Knuckles Deep Method from Letterkenny. Um, though that was entirely explicit, uh, <clears throat> though that wasn't entirely explicit, uh, this probably would be a good time to issue a warning to all new listeners that the show is very NSFW. Um, just be grateful uh, before, just be grateful that before. I didn't go into detail about what constitutes uh, it being a three knuckler um, in your ass. You know, I do think that the third knuckle is your big knuckle and everyone should always aim for getting the entire fist, you know, not just the knuckle in there when possible. Anyways, <clears throat> some announcements before we begin. Number one, this is not a standard serial killer podcast where I only give you the story and the trial of the serial killer, you know, go over like explain all the, Deep, spooky, scary shit that they did. Go go over some of the horrible crimes he did. You know, kind of like glorify the killer. Uh, <laughs> no, um, not all serial killer podcasts do that. Not all true crime does that. But <clears throat> I do a primarily a history show. And due to the nature of history and the fact that many of these accounts could be wrong or inaccurate or just outright not say a ton, it is my belief that I, as the orator, of this information should provide an understanding to these ancient serial killer accounts. Meaning I will give as much factual historical information about the time period and social circles that the <clears throat> historical figures belong to. So you can understand why they may have actually done it or why maybe they didn't do it and why they was just probably propaganda. Now, if you're here for the short, quick one minute explanation of today's tale, I'll provide it right now. Uh, it will also be a clip probably on YouTube. So <clears throat> let me uh, do this real quick. <clears throat> Liu Bengli, possibly born circa 165 BC, will inherit a kingdom given to him via his uncle, Emperor Jing, after Pengli's father, Liu Wu, got banished because his buddies decided to try and assassinate some old dude uh, that the Emperor, uh, Emperor Jing was fond of and might have been fucking. After Liu Pengli inherits this, king, uh, inherits this kingdom in 144 BC, he and some of his buddies decided it would be fun to go on, um, go out and murder peasants and rob them just, you know, just because, uh, potentially killing over 100 people. 
This is one of the first times in history a ruler kills on a whim and not for gains of wealth or power, leading many modern historians to speculate Liu Pengli as being one of the first ever recorded serial killers. Eventually, Liu Pengli is told on by some snitchy bitch whose feelings got hurt because, and I quote, Oh no, his family's dead or whatever, um, which is you know probably from Liu Pengli in some uh, historical account. And then the emperor is subsequently requested to kill Liu, but uh, Jing, I guess, feels bad for exiling his brother and doesn't want to kill his little nephew and instead banishes, his, banishes him, supposedly. And that's it. The main historical record for this account only mentions Liu Pengli in like two paragraphs, and it says that he may have killed over 100 or so people. Um, and they kind of go over the request to have him killed and then Peng Li's subsequent banishment uh, with literally nothing else to go off. They don't even talk about the guy's life after he's banished, which is fucking nuts. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so if you are satisfied with that information and don't need to listen to more, please leave me a five star review and subscribe to the YouTube channel. And you may stop listening to this episode and enjoy the rest of your day. We all love you. Okay. Now that the Gen Z TikTok brain rotted listeners have all left, um, I hope you guys are all ready for a rich and fascinating deep dive into the Han Dynasty that Liu Pengli hails from. It's complex political intrigue and much more details that we can glean about today's tale as we go over it. Uh, we will first be going over the origins of the Han Dynasty and some of Pengli's much cooler, less serial killery ancestors. Then we will go over the events that lead up to Liu Pengli inheriting the kingdom. After which, we'll go over Liu's story in the second part of this episode, um, as I'm recording this currently at midnight on the day that this episode is supposed to release. So <laughs> um, I had a very, very busy weekend. So I'm going to get through as much of this as I can today. I wrote up a whole lot and we're going to try our fucking best. Uh, and it's midnight, so I'm trying to, you know, not necessarily be fucking noisy. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not giving you my best and I feel like I could do... Uh, I could do the tale a little more justice, like the exact accounts and stuff. Uh, but the Han Dynasty and like kind of like historical information bit, you'll get this in part one. So I guess if you really don't want to listen to this and you just want to hear like just the story and the stuff that I was able to glean from it, you can do that next episode. Uh, but that's kind of lame. Uh, <laughs> anyways, <clears throat> so, um, anyways, after we do the story, um, what new information stories got in the next episode, we'll go over the accounts, uh, authenticity and some final thoughts on the following episode. Now for the other announcements. Um, I don't know. I only added the plural, uh, to, to announcements because it felt weird just saying quick announcement and like it got into my head while I was typing it out. And so I just didn't bother to edit it. And this whole ramble was straight up typed up. Uh, I am legitimately reading this from my screen right now from the prompter and for sure had ample time to change this bit, but now it's gone on too long. So I feel like I have to continue this until we probably just start the episode like, you know, like right now or something. Um, you are listening to historical quarrels. Okay. So first off, go ahead and get a little bit introduced to the people in our story or the Han dynasty. <clears throat> So, in 206 BC, we have the end of the Qin Dynasty and the establishment of the Han Dynasty. Uh, the end of the Qin Dynasty and the establishment of the Han Dynasty in 206 is a very pivotal moment in Chinese history, make, marking the transition from the harsh legalism of the Qin uh, to the more balanced government of the Han. This event, led by Liu Bang, later Emperor Gaozu, concluded the tumultuous period following the fall of the Qin and set the stage for one of China's golden ages. It might be Xin, because uh, it's Q-I-N. I couldn't get, like, the exact pronunciation. I need to look up the... I Again, I did not have a lot of time. Usually I do the pronunciation guide, like, the night before, and I practice some of, the, like, the main words. Like, it was my wife's birthday. Happy birthday to my wife. Um, <laughs> love her to death. And uh, I threw her a little surprise party today, and I cooked, and I, like, you know, I got everything all clean, and I, yeah, and there's a whole lot and had a whole bunch of people over and then you know, I had some guests go over and people, you know, and we were here late and it was, it was good. You know, I love spending time with them. And so, um, I prioritize people, my people in my life over, um, this show sometimes. And, uh, I think that's a good thing to do. I think, uh, you know, I'm still recording it and I'm making sure it gets done. So you guys get something, but yeah, <laughs> again, 
forgive me if I just fuck up pronunciations. I am going to super fuck, fuck them up. Okay. <clears throat> but real quick, uh, let's just kind of quickly go over the fall of the uh, Qin or Jin dynasties, uh, which was from 221 BC to 206 BC. Uh, so number one, we have the unification of China. So prior to the Qin dynasty, China was divided into various warring states. Uh, Qin Shi Huang, uh, Huang, the first emperor, unified these states in 221 BC. This unification brought together disparate regions, each with its own customs and systems, under a single central, centralized administration. This was a monumental achievement that laid the foundation for, future ter- for the future territorial concept of China. A very conceptual phase for it. <clears throat> we also have the uh, Qin Dynasty's implementations of a widespread standardization, right, which had lasting impacts on Chinese society. Examples of this include standardization of weights and measures, the Chinese script, and even the width of cart axles. That's right, cart axles. They were, they were very specific about this shit. Uh, they like to standardize everything. You know, which kind of makes sense. Like, uh, the more things are kind of like standardized, the better it is. But then that you know, that just turns shit into robots, man. And makes it all lame. Like I want my car axles to be like three and a half inches thick. I don't need it to be like that one and a half inch, you know, fucking bullshit. And I'm positive. This is what, you know, people back in China, China's like ancient days would get high in opium and then like talk about (laughs) like, like, man, the fucking emperor, the emperor's like turning us all into like machines, man. (laughs) Shit like that. Fucking playing on their loot <laughs> instead of like a guitar. Anyways, the standardization uh, facilitated trade, communication, and governance across the, new- the newly unified empire, demonstrating Qin Shi Huang's vision for a cohesive and efficient state. Okay. We also have the construction of the Great Wall, which was a massive defense project uh, against northern invaders. It involved the labor of hundreds of thousands of workers and was a symbol to the Qin Dynasty's strength and its harsh labor policies. This monumental structure, although later enhanced by subsequent dynasties, originated under Qin Shi Huang and stands as a testament to the dynasty's ambition and capacity for large-scale projects. We also have the Terracotta Army. Uh, it was discovered in 1974 near Qin Shi Huang's tomb. Uh, it is another remarkable example of the dynasty's impact, consisting of thousands of life-sized clay soldiers, horses, and chariots. And if you've ever seen The Mummy 3... Uh, you know how fucking lame they made it uh, out to be, man. They, they they just not do that shit justice. They made, uh, uh, I don't know, they made it kind of fucking lame. Anyways, uh, <clears throat> it was meant to protect the emperor in the afterlife. It was kind of like, a, again, very like almost Egyptian-esque where the, the pharaohs thought they could bring shit from their, you know, current life into the afterlife. It's like, yeah, yeah, I'm rich and I'm going to be rich in the afterlife too. And so the emperor kind of had the same idea. It's like, yeah, I commanded a great army. I'm going to create a, command a great army in heaven as well. So this archaeological discovery provides invaluable insights into the military practices, artistry, and religious beliefs of the Qin period. Uh, these examples ex- illustrate the dual nature of the Qin dynasty. It's groundbreaking, groundbreaking achievements in unifying and standardizing China. And it's heavily impressive regime. I'm talking fucking terrible. Like they, um, they were very rigorous in labor demands and strict uh, legalist philosophy. You know, where, uh, let's say, you go against their philosophical uh, philosophical or political ideals, and then they force you to work for them. I I don't know. I'm glad they stopped doing that. Oh, man. Okay, anyways. <clears throat> so, uh, and then they had a, the popular uprising. So the harshness of the Qin rule led to widespread, dis- widespread dissatisfaction. Uh, the fall of the Qin dynasty was precipitated by widespread uh, kind of like rebellions resulting from its harsh rule. They were a little too, a little too harsh with the whip there. A little, a little too, too forceful in making sure that the Great Wall was built. Uh, <laughs> so... The one of the main uprisings was the Da Xiang, or Da Ze Xiang uprising. Uh, it was one of the earliest and most significant rebellions. It was led by Chen Sheng and Wu Guang. Uh, this revolt was initially sparked by a group of conscripted soldiers who were going to be executed for being delayed by flooding on their way to a frontier post. Yeah, it's, it's 
very fair to execute them for something that they can't control. I totally agree with that. That was a very reasonable and accurate decision for the kingdom to make. <clears throat> the rebellion quickly tapped into broader public discontent with the kin's oppressive regime, setting off a chain of events that led to more uprisings across the empire. <laughs> Pretty pissed about that, understandably. <clears throat> So the uprisings were not limited to any single class. Uh, it wasn't just peasants that were upset. They involved a wide spectrum of, of society. There's disaffected peasants overburdened by high taxes and forced labor that played a very significant role. And additionally, members of former nobility and officials who had lost their power and status due to the kin's centralization policies. Uh, they also joined the rebellion, seeing an opportunity to regain influence and maybe some of their power back. Uh, <clears throat> then we have the rebellion of Xiang Yu and Liu Bang. Uh, the chaos following the death of Qin Shi Huang and the incompetence of his successor, Qin Er Shi, provided the, a, the perfect storm, the perfect shitstorm for more organized and potent rebellions. Better, better organization, better rebellions, better pizza. Uh, that, that's a joke from Time Suck. Sorry, Dan. I just... I just thought that we, you know, it's kind of funny. I just, I just thought about that as I was saying that. I was like, <laughs> yeah, more organization, more rebellions. Fuck yeah. <laughs> uh, more pizza. The most notable were those led by Xiang Yu and Liu Bang. Uh, later, Emperor Gao Zhu Han, Liu Bang's eventual victory over Xiang Yu and his establishment of the Han Dynasty signaled the end of the Qin Dynasty and the beginning of a new era in Chinese history. <clears throat> and primarily these examples were to de demonstrate how the oppressive policies of the Qin dynasty coupled with the weak leadership after Qin, Shuang, uh, Qin Shi Huang's death created a fertile ground for uprisings. Um, and this kind of would lead in later um, into the story with Liu Pengli, where peasants felt more emboldened, I guess, to go against uh, their king. But like, I mean, it still took 30 fucking years for the guy to get any sort of like repercussions for sh the shit that he was committing. But I mean, this kind of like set the, set the precedent uh, for that sort of like culture in China where they felt like they could kind of, I don't know. He kind of oppressed them fucking hard though. It was definitely like an abusive spouse situation. You know, they're just like, they're like, no, it's fine. We're okay. He's only killing some of us. <laughs> Anyways, we have, we have Liu Bang's uh, rise to power. So his, in his early life, Luo, Luo Bang was born in a peasant family in Pei County, um, which is present day uh, Zush, uh, oh God, Zush, Zhu, or Jiangsu Pro Providence. He initially worked as a patrol officer responsible for transporting convicts. His humble beginnings are significant as they contrast sharply with the norm of aristocratic or noble lineage typically associated with the founding, oh, you see, the founding emperors in Chinese history. <clears throat> and during the widespread uprisings, uh, he, you know, Liu really saw an opportunity to rise above his station. He first made his mark by breaking his convoy of uh, convicts, persuading them to join him in the rebellion against the kin. So like on the job, he was like, listen, guys, I'm not going to send you to prison, but you all need to follow me and fuck some people up. <clears throat> this would kind of play into like his charisma and leadership. Uh, his leadership style was marked by his ability to connect with both the common people and influential figures. figures. He was known for his practical approach to governance and warfare often favoring strategies that would minimize unnecessary conflict and loss. The dude didn't like death. It's just really weird that one of his great-great-grandkids <laughs> really liked killing people, but whatever. This approach helped him gather a broad set base of support, crucial for his eventual success in establishing the Han Dynasty. And it, this is kind of one of those, like, zero-to-hero cases. You know, you definitely had, like, that Hercules lore about him, which is really fucking cool. Anyways... Liu Bang would go on to create an alliance. So Liu Bang and Xiang Yu initially joined forces as part of a coalition of rebel leaders against the Qin dynasty. This coalition was instrumental in the fall of the Qin, with different rebel leaders controlling various parts of the empire. The alliance between Liu Bang and Xiang Yu was based on a mutual goal of overthrowing the Qin, but lacked deeper cohesion or shared vision of the post-Qin era. And then 
One of the famous incidents that epitomizes the tension between Liu Bang and Jiang Yu is the Hongmen Banquet. After the fall of the kid, Jiang Yu hosted a banquet, and Liu Bang was invited. And when he got there, <clears throat> it, he, he kind of like realized it was, uh, it was not that good of a banquet. They, they only had two pigs. And Liu Bang uh, would go up to Zhang Yu and tell him that that was an insult to him for all that he had done. He's like, oh, hey, you know, we won all these battles against the kin, and all you do is you offer me two pigs. Fuck you. And then they started, like, slapping each other um, during this banquet, and uh, it was like a back-and-forth slap. And eventually, the men uh, who followed both of these leaders got up, and they started, like, battling and, like, dabbing each other and... It, it turned bloody, but like the whole time, Liu Liu Bang and Xiang uh, Xiang Yu were just slapping each other throughout this whole whole banquet, just fucking crazy. And that this is what would you know lead into them having their war. And um, eventually, these two uh, would decide the fate of China uh, and like who was going to be uh, the next emperor and who was going to you know control everything uh, because of this slap fight. Okay, no. <laughs> if you believe that, I'm sorry. <laughs> There's a, there's a little, little, little fake out there. <laughs> I, just, I started like improvising. I'm like, yeah, so yeah, he, he only got two pigs and he was upset about it. <laughs> that sounds like some sort of crazy fucking story in history. No, anyways, sorry. No, the Hongmen banquet, it was, it was rumored to be a trap to assassinate Liu Bang. Uh, and uh, luckily Liu, Liu uh, managed to escape thanks to the intervention of his advisors and the persuasiveness of Zhang Yu's uncle, Zhang Bo. This event significantly deteriorated the trust between the two leaders. <sighs> it is often cited as a turning point towards open conflict, which makes sense. I mean, I feel like if someone invited me over for dinner and then I found out from their uncle that they were actually trying to kill me, I'd be pretty pissed too. And, you know, I'd be like, well, you were my homie, but uh, time to die, bitch. <laughs> okay. The disintegration of their alliance led to the Chuhan contention of 206 to 202 BC, which is a civil war for control of China. Liu Bang led the Han forces, while Zhang Yu led the Chu. This period was marked by several military engagements, shifting alliances, and strategic maneuvers. Not just a military struggle, but also a contest of political legitimacy and vision for future China. I will cover that, this entire conflict between the two in a future uh, quarrel. Honestly, it's, it was really fascinating. I could go much more in depth to it, but I'm not going to. I'm trying to focus, just kind of, you know, give you this breakdown of what would lead to the Han Dynasty and what would lead to, the, like, this political intrigue and let Liu Peng Li uh, kill for, with basically, you know, no repercussions for 30 years. But, continuing on. <clears throat> okay. So we have the Battle of Julu. Uh, which was one of the early and crucial battles of the Chuan contention. Uh, Jiang Yu's forces besieged the Qin, uh, Qin army, and then Liu Bang, allied with other rebel leaders, played a role in this battle. Jiang Yu's decisive victory at Julu showcased his military prowess and reinforced his position as a leading contender for the control of China, so people are like, ah, oh, this guy's fucking cool. But then we have the conquest of the Qin capital, uh, and after the fall of everything, both Liu Bang and Jiang Yu raced to conquer uh, Xiangyang, the Qin capital. Liu Bang's forces arrived for first, and his occupation of the city was a strategic advantage. This is essentially what you know lead to him to being like, "Hey, I'm in charge." Okay, <clears throat> so and then we have the founding of the Han Dynasty after the Treaty of Hong Canal, uh, where you know Liu Liu Bang and um, Zhang Yu divided the empire a little bit. Uh, the division did not like, last long, as mutual distrust and ambition led to the resumption of hostilities, and they began kind of fighting back and forth, and Liu Bang would just kind of take over. Okay. <clears throat> so, although initially, uh, although the capital was initially set up at Luo Yang, Liu Bang would move his capital to Chang'an, which is near modern-day Xi'an. This capital would become a symbol of Han power and one of the most important cultural, economic, and political centers in China, and would really be, like the proclamation of the dynasty right here. So <clears throat> he, he essentially declared the establishment of the Han dynasty after he beat Jiang Yu. And 
This uh, represented a shift from the autocratic and centralized rule of the kin to a more balanced and stable imperial system that Liu Bang would implement in China. So <clears throat> Chang'an as the capital um, was very strategic. Uh, the city's location made it a hub for trade and cultural exchange, and its positioning away from the eastern seaboard protected it from potential invasions. It was just a lot harder to, for invaders to come in and fuck up the capital and maybe kill the emperor. Chang'an would later become one of the largest and most cosmopolitan cities in the ancient world, reflecting the Han Dynasty's power and cultural influence. Uh, in addition to that change, Liu Bang would also, um, or Emperor Gaozu's, one of his most notable reforms was the reduction of taxes. The, heaven, the heavy taxation and labor demands of the Qin Dynasty had led to widespread discontent. Uh, reducing these burdens helped to stabilize the empire and regain the trust of the populace. This approach was not, not only eased the economic pressure on which the common people, on the common people, but also helped in rebuilding the empire's agricultural base, which was crucial for its sustenance and growth. This is one of the few times where, you know, a people-backed politician actually, you know, made good on his promise to lower fucking taxes. Uh, Liu Bang fucking did it. Uh, his, his little campaign worked and he followed through on that campaign. God damn it. Okay. <clears throat> also, in response to the Qin's highly centralized control, Emperor Gao Zhu, or Liu Bang, implemented a more decentralized military structure. He granted military powers to local authorities and regional kings, including members of his own family. This is what would lead to Liu Pengli being able to essentially form a band and kill whoever the fuck he wanted. This policy was aimed at preventing the concentration of military power that could pose a threat to the emperor. Although, it would later lead to issues of regional autonomy and power struggle, so it... Hmm. Did not solve that problem at all. You know, it's... Uh, I feel like that's, that one's kind of obvious, though, right? Where you're letting them build their own, like, and be in control of their own you know, armies. Those, those armies are going to typically be more li loyal to their commanders. And fucking, that makes no goddamn sense. Like, how you would, I, I don't know. I don't know how that was justified, but whatever. It was probably like, ah, oh, listen, I want to keep these regional people happy. You know, like, these rulers happy. If I keep the mobility happy, I keep, and the populace is now happy with the, you know, less taxations. Um, but then since the rich people aren't getting money from the taxing anymore, they're, you know, they, they gave them the army and that's probably, that was like the compromise that he did is while the Qin dynasty dynasty heavily favored legalist doctrines Emperor Gao Xu or Liu Bang introduced a governance style that sought a balance between legalist and Confucian ideals. He patronized Confucian scholars and integrated Confucian principles, emphasizing moral governance and ethical conduct into the administrative framework. This adoption marked the beginning of Confucianism's rise as a guiding philosophy in Chinese imperial governance. It wasn't like, you know, like, a big deal, but it was, it was, pretty, it was a pretty fucking big deal for him to do some Confucianism shit. Anyways, <clears throat> So one of Gaozu's significant policies was also land re redistribution, which aimed at reducing the concentration of land ownership, which had been a source of inequality during the Qin Dynasty. The re this reform boosted agricultural production, uh, which was became a very big cornerstone for the Han economy. And by granting more peasants access to land, this not only stabilized the food supply, but also increased the economic base of the empire because there are more people making money. Uh, that's more people to like kind of spend, spend money and uh, keeping, keeping the money flowing. Because, um, like, usually people who... Or rich people would just hoard their money and be like dragons and not spend the money as much. And, you know, it leads to more people becoming poorer and poorer and poorer. What you need to have is you need to have a lot of people with, you know, a good amount of money spending and keeping that money constantly flowing. So even the rich people need to be spending it. So the rich people are going to be spending on this. And it's kind of like why capitalism works in a way with the trickle down doctrine uh, where if, you know, workers are given enough money, they are able to spend it, spend it, spend it. Uh, that money is, then kind of goes back, but then that money gets spent by the rich people back into the, you know, kind of like flow here and everyone's happy because everyone's living their best life. That's the idea. Uh, what America has is not that anymore. As we're seeing now, um, you know, people are starting to keep their money and, hoard it and hoard it and hoard it and spend it only with other rich people and not with the populace. So that's sucks. <laughs> but 
But anyways, <clears throat> we also have the uh, establishment of the imperial examination system uh, that he did. So although the system was more fully developed in later dynasties, the roots of the imperial examination system can be traced back to Gao Xu's reign. By selecting government officials based on merit and knowledge, particularly on Confucian texts, you know, kind of more holy knowledge, but a little less so with Confucianism, Gao Xu laid the groundwork for a bureaucracy that was more efficient and less susceptible to corruption. The system played a crucial role in the administrative success of the Han Dynasty. You know, it's kind of weird how when you vet out people and make sure that they're qualified for a job, they're typically not going to fuck, out, fuck up that job as much. Super fucking weird. I don't know. You'd think that you'd fucking... America would do that, but yeah, whatever. Okay. <clears throat> and then we also have legal reforms and penal code modifications. Gao Xu, Liu Bing, moderated the harsh legalist laws of the Qin d- d- dynasty by incorporating Confucian moral principles. The legal reforms under his reign saw a reduction in the severity of punishments and an emphasis on rehabilitation. Confucianism was all about the... Like, you know, working on yourself and bettering yourself uh, sort of ideal here. These changes reflected a more humane approach to law and order, aligning with Confucian ideals of moral rectitude and governance. And a lot of these foundational policies of Emperor Gaoshu were pivotal in transitioning from the auto- autocratic and harsh rule of the kin to a more balanced, sus- sustainable system under that of the Han. By promoting agricultural prosperity, establishing a merit-based bureaucracy, and reforming the legal system, Gaoshu set the stage for the long-term stability and success of the Han Dynasty. And why a lot of people would associate the Han Dynasty with kind of like the golden age of ancient China. Fucking, they killed, man. They're fucking awesome. You know, during this time, their culture was flourishing. They had uh, technological and scientific innovations. Uh, A couple of these are actually pretty cool. They witnessed uh, remarkable technological and scientific progress. One notable in- in- invention was paper, which is attributed to Kai Lun in 105 AD, which revolutionized record keeping and dissemination of information. Additionally, significant advancements were made in astronomy, mathematics, and medicine, epitomized by figures like Zhang Heng, who, first, who invented the first uh, seismoscope for detecting earthquakes. It's really fucking cool, man. And then their expansion and trade uh, under, you know, under emperors like Wu, the Han Dynasty expanded significantly, extending China's influence to, into Central Asia, Korea, and Vietnam. So uh, the Han Dynasty and really like what Emperor Gao Xu would do was very significant uh, during this period of China. They fucking kicked ass and people were loving, loving on it, right? <clears throat> and then we have uh, after... Liu Bang. We have the reign of Emperor Yui, who is the son of Liu Bang. So, uh, as the eldest son, as the eldest son of Liu Bang and his wife, Empress Liu Xi, Emperor Yui, who was born Liu Ying, was the direct descendant of the dynasty's founder. His position as the eldest son typically d- designated him as the heir apparent, in line with the traditional Chinese emphasis on pr- primogeniture primogeniture or like you know the first son kind of inherits everything sort of idea but also part of this was due to his mother's influence so empress lu shi uh, emperor hui's mother was a formidable figure in the han court her influence was substantial both during lu bang's reign and after his death as Emperor Yui uh, ascended the throne her role became even more pronounced leading her to to leading to her becoming one of the most powerful figures in the early Han dynasty. And the transition from Emperor Gaoshu to Emperor Yui in 195 BC was a very significant moment for the Han dynasty. It marked the first peaceful transfer of power since the dynasty's establishment, setting a precedent for future successions. The transition was crucial for maintaining the stability and continuity of Liu Bang's policies and reforms. Uh, You know, it's... It's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess that's good. You know, you, where you don't have to have a civil war every single fucking time someone dies and, you know, power needs to be reestablished. <laughs> that's pretty cool. <clears throat> okay. And then we also have Empress Dowager Lu's influence. So, Empress 
Dowager lose significant influence during Emperor Huey's reign is a very notable example of power dynamics in the Han Imperial Court. Um, and this is something that will come into play later with Liu Pengli, as Liu Pengli's own mother is going to be responsible for Liu Pengli becoming king of the that kingdom that his uncle, the emperor, will allow him to be. If it wasn't for his mom and for uh, the way the court and the intrigue works, and from this president, honestly, that's being established here, uh, we would not have a story to talk about today. Besides maybe, you know, you know that war between Liu Bang and uh, Zhang Yu, but that's that's fine. <laughs> um, again, that's going to be a story for another time, and it's really fucking cool. It was really cool. So I'm kind of excited to write for it. I marked it in my notes as like, yeah, you're going you're gonna to do this in like a month. <laughs> so... And hopefully not fuck up the names as much. Okay, anyways. <clears throat> Empress Dowager Lu effectively acted as regent during Emperor Hui's reign, particularly because em- Emperor Hui was seen as a more as a more passive ruler. So she exercised substantial control over the government's affairs, influencing decisions and policies. Her ability to maintain power was a testament to her political ac- acumen and understanding of the court dynamics. Empress Dowager Lu was adept at political maneuvering. She placed members of her own family in key positions within the government, thereby ensuring her influence and control over the state's affairs. This strategy not only solidified her power, but also helped in navigating the complex landscape of court politics. Yeah, as like by putting your own family there, they're definitely a lot more keen to listen to people that they personally know than, you know, some random fucking Jerry that <laughs> just showed up in China. You know, Jerry and fucking China being like, hey, you know, guys, I think we should, uh, you know, fix these roads and work on, you know, peasant uh, reforms and policies, uh, trying to think about what the class structure should really look out. And really, if we should even call it a class structure, maybe it shouldn't be a class structure and just kind of let people be people. And then uh, Duaga Lu would be like, whatever, Jerry, get the fuck out of here, you fucking weirdo. I don't want you in here. And then replaced it with her uncle, um, Jim. <laughs> Jerry would get replaced by, you know, Uncle Jim. Anyways, <clears throat> one of the most significant impacts of Empress Dowager Lu's influence was on the succession of the throne. So after Emperor Huey's death, she orchestrated the ascension and deposition of several emperors from the Liu family to maintain her control. Uh, this was an episode known as the Liu clan disturbance. This period highlighted the extent of her power and the impact of her influence on the Han dynasty's political stability. Empress Dowager Lu's role during Emperor Hu's reign is a very, very distri- striking example of the influence a non-ruling figure could ru- wield in ancient Chinese politics, particularly in a dynasty's early years when the succession of power structures were still being solidified. And again, this is v- again very important to our story. It lets us kind of understand how the Han court system worked. Uh, why? Potentially that uh, Liu Pengli was spared uh, an execution. It's important for, you know, the story overall. It's, this is why we need to understand context and like how things were established and the precedents that were set. And, you know, it helps us kind of contextualize and understand people's actions in the future or like why they took certain actions. And it's because of shit like this. Anyways, continuing on with Emperor Huey though, because uh, I do kind of want to talk about his role a little bit. Uh, he, 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 had very little limited political initiative. He was often described as a ruler who lacked the political assertiveness uh, that was characterized in his father, Emperor Gaoshu or Liu Bang. Uh, <clears throat> and this trait meant that he was less involved in active, the active governance of the empire, leaving many decisions to his mother, Empress Liu, and her appointed officials. Also to being cucked by his mother a couple of times. He would, uh, you know try and get a girl pregnant and his mother would come in and just finger blast her for about an hour typically. And he'd just kind of sit there and, you know, do like a sad, like slow jerk, which is really weird because it was his mom finger blasting his wife. Uh, It was really gross to read, but that's, you know, whatever. Um, And really the overwhelming influence of his mom significantly contributed to his passive role. She uh, definitely infantilized him and uh, she was the de facto ruler. She was like the mama lying behind the throne, uh, making all the administrative and political decisions. Again, yeah, she fucking killed it, man. 
And she said, no, fucking fuzzing with the shit that she did. Crazy. <clears throat> and part of that had to be, you know, her husband's influence. But uh, during this time, there were some economic relief measures. Um, these were uh, policies that were originally initiated by Emperor Liu Bang or Gao Shu, uh, such as the reduced taxes and lighter corvée labor demands. Uh, but they continued under Emperor Huyi. Uh, these measures provided ongoing relief to the peasantry who had suffered under the harsh policies of the Qin Dynasty. The continuity was a crucial in maintaining the stability and support of the common people. There's also a bunch of like land distribution again, which aimed to reduce the concentration of land ownership by just like one or two people. Uh, legal reforms that were again initiated by Gao Shu, they kind of just kind of continued under uh, Huey's reign. Uh, but an interesting part of this is we have uh, a lot of elimination of rivals. So one of the most infamous actions of Empress Lu was the elimination, elimination of consort Qi, one of Liu Bang's favorite concubines. Uh, she was pretty jealous uh, of, of uh, consort Qi. She, uh, she didn't like that her husband was uh, banging other people, probably. Uh, you know, this is a, a big deal with the Turks. <laughs> uh, anyways, so she took care of uh, Consort Qi and her son Liu Ruyi, who was seen as a potential rival to Emperor Huyi. Consort Qi was subjected to the cruel treatment uh, of, you know, being tortured, uh, probably being finger blasted by Empress Liu. <laughs> just like to imagine her just like fucking... You know, you know, during her entire reign, just finger blasting a lot of people. Even if you're a dude, you probably got, you know, her fist up your ass or something. Fucking controlled you like a puppet. God damn. But anyways, uh, she was a concert key was eventually killed. And Liu Rui, who is the prince of Xiao, was poisoned on orders allegedly given by Empress Liu. And this, uh, and you know, she didn't even want to see her husband's like a little affair baby, you know, concubine baby. <laughs> alive. Um, and another example is the treatment of Liu Heng, who was um, later to become Emperor Wen of Han. Fearing his potential as a rival, Empress Liu planned to have him killed. However, thanks to the intervention of officials who admired his character, Liu Heng was instead sent away to become the King of Dai, a, more, a move that inadvertently saved his life and allowed him to ascend to the throne later. So... Good job, Empress Liu. You uh, kept him alive by doing that. <clears throat> and all of these actions were a part of Empress Liu's broader strategy to eliminate the threats to her son's rule and to strengthen her own family's position within the empire. And by removing potential claimants to the throne, she aimed to secure a smooth succession for her, her lineage and her lineage alone. It was only her cum babies, her cum pets that were allowed to fucking rule the kingdom. But is it very ruthless and uh, brutal? And this is kind of lends an air of like credence to uh, maybe Peng Li is being framed uh, for these crimes, and he wasn't actually, you know, a fucking ruthless cold blooded serial killer, because you know shit was said back then uh, just to discredit families to ensure a family of like a specific mother or concubine maintained power. And this, and this is this is why this is important to understand. Again, if you're not getting this and you're not understanding why like context is important to history, then I don't know what to fucking tell you. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's incredibly important. Okay. So fucking let's, let's keep this up. But anyways, uh, during this time, despite the political turmoil within the imperial court uh, during Huey's reign, the Han of the city as a whole maintained a level of stability and prosperity. The period saw continued economic growth and recovery from earlier upheavals. Uh, again, these agricultural policies, the trade and commerce, infrastructure development, all of this really, really fucking aided into keeping Han Dynasty stable. And that was important. And another thing that continued, and that was also very important, was the maintain maintenance of Confucian ideals uh, during his reign. So we have the moral governance practice. So even though Emperor Huey was not, an act, was not the active rule, ruler, the Confucian principles of moral governance, righteousness, and uh, filial, filial piety continued to be upheld uh, as ideals within the court and administration. 
Officials were expected to embody these virtues in their conduct and decision-making, a practice that helps maintain the ethical standards of governance. Uh, the influence of Confucian scholars and advisors in the court continued during this period as well. These scholars played a role in advising the emperor and other officials promoting Confucian ideals in the, in the administration. And this is really fucking important because a lot of these advisors would tutor children of uh, certain people. And some advisors in the future uh, might be related to a certain uh, serial killer's father as uh, being the tutor for his kids. And that uh, tutor... Uh, conspired to assassinate one of the emperor's favorite old dudes in his court. And uh, it's what would lead to Pengli's dad getting exiled. And um, But yeah, so this is when this kind of gets established. It's during Huey's reign. Uh, <clears throat> but anyways, yeah, so they would teach uh, Confucian ideals, uh, and their presence helped ensure that despite the political power dynamics, Confucian principles remained uh, remained a guiding philosophy in state affairs. Confucianism is highly important and highly popular here. So with that, the maintenance of Confucian ideals was also important for the dynasty's public image and legitimacy. Upholding these principles helped pr uh, present the emperor as a morally upright ruler in line with Confucian ideal of the uh, son of heaven governing with virtue and benevolence. Uh, you know, kind of like a god king in a way. This was crucial for maintaining public support and social stability, despite the power struggles within the imperial palace. And it didn't really, like, impact the imperial pa palace anyways. But overall, Emperor Hugh's reign is often viewed for the, uh, through the lens of the dominance of Empress Lu. His own contributions are overshadowed by her actions, and his reign is really just seen as a transitional period, maintaining stability, but marked by court intrigues and consolidation of power by the Lu family. Okay. So, we're going to talk about Liu Hang now a little more. This was the fourth son of Emperor Gao Zhu. Um, the, the, his early life was not marked by the expectation of ascension to the throne. He, he definitely wasn't expecting it. He was like, ah, yeah, I'm not going to get it. You know, so this likely influenced his upbringing and the development of his character, which was later described as humble and benevolent. Uh, he realized, you know, he didn't, he wasn't going to be king and that didn't fucking matter, which was a very in stark contract to the typical imperial upbringing of, um, that his half brothers might have received. So Liu Hang's eventual ascension to the throne as emperor of Wen was somewhat unexpected. His selection as emperor was influenced by a combination of his own virtues and the political circumstances of the time including the influence of his mother and the support of key officials, uh, key court officials who valued his character and potential as a just ruler. So let's kind of get into his selection of emperor, right? Empress Liu, the mother of Emperor Huey and the power behind the throne during his reign played a crucial role in the selection of the next emperor. She preferred a successor who could be more easily influenced or controlled. And Liu Heng, with his mother being of lower birth, was seen as less likely to have a strong backing from powerful factions, making him a more controllable candidate in Empress Liu's eyes. So you know how she originally wanted this guy fucking dead? Now she sees him as like a someone that she can kind of manipulate and control a lot easier. So this belief that Liu Kang would be more manageable as an emperor stemmed from his perceived lack of powerful maternal relatives who could assert influence at the court. This was a significant consideration as emperors with strong maternal families often saw these relatives wield considerable power, sometimes leading to internal strife and power struggles in the court. As, you know, with Empress Liu, she was you know, fucking crazy with that shit. Ironically, however, Liu Kang's reign as emperor Wen turned out to be one of the most successful and stable in Han Dynasty's history. He proved to be an efficient and benevolent ruler, contrary to the expectations of those who thought he would merely be a puppet. His reign was marked by wise governance, economic prosperity, and a significant reduction in the harshness of laws and punishment. Which is really fucking cool. So, you know, like, you know, they thought they could control him, and, you know, he was like, nah, fuck that. Fuck you. You go fuck yourself. So what he did was... um Understanding the economic hardships faced by subjects, Emperor Wen significant lower tax rates, even more, uh, even more than what you know Liu Bang had already established. This relief was crucial after the heavy taxation under the Qin Dynasty, 
And, um, you know, for instance, uh, he is known to have reduced the tax rate to a much more manageable level, sometimes as low as one thirtieth of the har- harvest instead of like, you know, like one tenth or, you know, like one eight, you know, one fifteenth or, you know, some crazy shit like that, which was a substantial decrease from previous rates. And he didn't even, you know, force the farmers to suck his dick, which that takes a lot of maturity and a lot of self-control and he really should be proud that he didn't, you know, force anyone to suck his penis. Just go goddamn proud. I, 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 I don't know if I could do that personally. I feel like if I was emperor, I, you know, with every, you know, bushel brought in, i I probably would have been like, yeah, it's, it's a two, like two minutes. It's a two minute blow job, you know, just two minutes straight, you know, set up a timer, get some sand, you know, flip over the hourglass and be like, okay, get to work. And, uh, you know, probably by the hundredth person, I probably would have climaxed at least once, maybe twice. So, um, you know, I feel like that just make court interesting and a lot more bearable to deal with, especially when you're dealing with like, you know, people's offerings and, uh, yeah, a blowjob would just kind of help. Um, <laughs> anyways, the corvée system, which required peasants to provide unpaid labor for state projects was a significant burden. And Emperor Wen reduced these demands, lessening the time peasants were required to work on government projects. This allowed them to spend more time on their own agricultural activities, thereby improving their livelihoods and boosting the economy. Weird how improving the livelihoods of a bunch of people instead of just one or two people leads to overall empire being better. Um, Yeah, that just... I don't know how people don't understand how that makes sense. Like improving the life quality and lifestyle for, you know, multiple people instead of just like a couple thousand, um, you know, multiple million people will always be better than just the couple thousand. And (sighs) such a fucking hard concept for people to understand for some reason here in America. I don't get it. These measures had a direct positive impact on agricultural productivity Uh, With lower taxes and fewer labor demands, peasants could focus more on farming, leading to increased agricultural output. This not only ensured a stable food supply for the empire, but also laid the foundation for economic prosperity. So Emperor Wen kicked some fucking ass, man. So in addition to everything else, he had moderation of harsh penalties, um, and then he had rehabilitation of mercy. Emperor Wen was the one who introduced concepts of rehabilitation and mercy into the legal system. This approach was based on the Confucian belief that people could be reformed and educated, as opposed to being strictly punished. For instance, he implemented policies that allowed for the reduction of sentences based on good behavior and repentance. If you repent, you can, you can come on to God again. Okay? You can come all over God. Let's do it. While retaining the legalist framework for his efficiency and structure, Emperor Wen also infused it with Confucian moral principles. This blend meant that laws were not only a means of maintaining order, but also a tool for moral education and the promotion of social harmony, which was you know, a very smart thing to do. It's something a lot of future rulers would do. And in addition to that, of course, he continued uh, land reforms. Um, he also set up some irrigation projects and ag- agricultural innovation. Emperor Wen supported the development and maintenance of irrigation systems, which is fucking crazy. This was done in like 100 and... 80 something BC. <laughs> fucking nuts to me. They were crucial for increasing agricultural productivity, obviously. I mean, fucking, we use irrigation systems today. My grandpa was a farmer. He had an irrigation system. Okay. He also promoted agricultural innovation, including the introduction of new farming techniques and crops, which led to increased yields and diversified agricultural production. Really smart. This guy was a really smart ruler. And understanding the importance of food security, Emperor Wen established the government granaries and implemented policies for famine relief. These granaries stored surplus grain during years of good harvest and distributed during times of scarcity, helping to stabilize grain prices and provide relief during famines. He's an overall great guy. Again, crazy that this guy's kind of like future relative would be a serial killer. <laughs> the, one of the first ones ever. Nuts. Okay. Now let's kind of talk about his foreign policy and military affairs, right? So Emperor Wen had a heavy non-aggression, non-aggression stance. Uh, this guy did not like 
fighting wars at all. He prioritized the internal development of the Han Dynasty over military expansion. He directed resources towards strengthening the economy, improving administrative, administrative efficiency, and enhancing the welfare of his subjects. This focus on domestic issues was pivotal, pivotal in stabilizing the empire after years of conflict. Emperor Wen preferred diplomatic solutions to conflicts with neighboring states and nomadic tribes. So rather than engaging in costly military campaigns, he sought to establish and maintain peaceful relations through alliances, marriage, diplomacy, and trade agreements. So a lot of this would come into play uh, later in, in the Han court where, you know, because of like how peaceful Emperor Wen is, it would very heavily influence Emperor Jing, who is the next emperor in this. So if you think I'm about to go over like 20 more emperors, don't worry, like, we just, we had like these three main emperors and then we we're talking about Emperor Jing. We're going to talk about Jing's brother in the next episode. Well, we're talking about Emperor Jing and Emperor Jing's brother in the next episode and then Liu Pengli some more. But yeah, so yeah, it's not going to be that fucking long because like this, <laughs> these murders occurred in 144 BC. So we're getting close to being there. Anyways, so um, he sought to establish and maintain peaceful relations through alliances um, and trade agreements and marriage diplomacy. Okay. Um, a notable example of this uh, was the continuation and reinforcement of the Qin policy, which was a system of marriage alliances with the Xiongu, Xiongnu. This policy was aimed at maintaining peace on the northern frontier without resorting to military action. So again, northern invaders constantly coming in and fucking up the ship. That's why they had to build a wall and why the Qin dynasty um, you know, got overthrown and they don't want to deal with that again. Okay. Let's kind of continue to talk about this a little bit because it actually is important. So the policy involved arranging marriages between the Han princesses and the Xiongu uh, leaders. These alliances were more than a mere matrimonial ties. They were diplomatic tools aimed at establishing peace and mutual understanding. For instance, Emperor Wen sent a Han princess to marry the Xiongu chieftain as part of this policy, reinforcing the peace between the Han and the Xiongu. Now, this was always great. Uh, a lot of these daughters definitely did not want to be married off to a chieftain. Um, <laughs> and uh, the emperor could just basically be like, okay, so uh, this cousin of mine is going to go fuck this uh, really crazy um, fucking savage guy. And uh, you're going to be his wife. And he's not going to invade us. Um, toodaloo. And so a lot of these girls uh, definitely would not want to be in that situation and would you know, look and vie for more political power. Like uh, Emperor Jing's brother's wife, um, who would, you know, play the, port, the court dynamics very well. So, accompanying these marriages, uh, li marriage alliances were systems of tribute and trade. The Han Dynasty would send valuable gifts and goods to Zhongnu as part of the Hecken Agreements. These, the Hecken, fucking Hecken Agreements. These Hecken Agreements, man, I'll tell you what. This exchange was not only a sign of goodwill, but also a means to facilitate trade and economic interaction between the two cultures. That's right. He didn't just like bow to them and like, you know, give them shit. It was, it was a little more sneaky and a little more uh, smart than that. And by continuing this policy, Emperor Wen effectively avoided costly military conflicts with the Xiongnu. This non-military approach was crucial in maintaining stability and allowed the Han Dynasty to focus resources on internal development rather than on frontier wars. Which is great. Allowed them to make a bunch of fucking money, dude. A lot of fucking money. Not only that, Emperor One would continue pa patronizing and promoting Confucianism, so as I kind of mentioned earlier. But uh, this time he would kind of do more of like an educational promotion. Uh, was, it, though not as extensive as under Emperor Wu, Emperor Ren uh, saw the promotion of Confucian education and teachings. So it would um, kind of like pop off a little more uh, here with Emperor Wen. Uh, this included the incorporation of Confucian principles in the training and education of officials. And again, it's going to be very important. Okay. Um, his cultural impact is this guy was looked at as the benevolent ruler. Uh, they see him as like, you know, akin to being a gift from heaven. Uh, it was an era of peace of prosperity. His reign is often seen as the beginning of the golden age of the Western Han dynasty. Uh, it was a period marked by internal peace, economic prosperity, and cultural development. Policies and approach to a governance had a lasting impact on the dynasty and were 
continued by his son, Emperor Jing. And that's where we're going to end tonight. Um, and I say tonight because it is 1.20 in the fucking morning. I know this episode is short, um, but goddamn, guys, I'm tired. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, get ready next Monday as we're going to go over Emperor Jing and we're going to go over the rest of this tale. And it's, uh, it's going to be a good one. I really hope I was able to shed some light on, on you know, Han Dynasty, the, like the early days of Han Dynasty. And I hope you guys learned something new and interesting. Uh, again, sorry that this episode's short, but it's uh, I have work in the morning. It's at one twenty right now, Monday morning. This episode's going to be up in fucking five hours and... Uh, no, I'm sorry, four hours and 40 minutes. So I love you guys. You have a good one. I will record next week and I will make sure it is fucking amazing. You guys have a good one. Goodbye.